Good morning, everyone, and welcome to another Big Data London webinar. Uh, today, we're focusing on data warehouse automation. So I'm Andy Steed, uh, Content Director of Big Data London, and I'm joined today by Simon Meacher. Hi, Simon. Hello. And Terry Mooney. Hello, Terry. Hello. So uh, the agenda today is uh, we're going to get a short presentation by Simon, and then Terry's going to attempt to build a cloud data warehouse in under 15 minutes. So stopwatches at the ready for that bit. Um, we uh, These sessions are designed to be interactive, so make sure you're asking questions all the way through using the uh, question function just beneath the screen. Um, I'll endeavor to ask as many to the uh, presenters after the presentations in the Q&A segment. Um, quick note of housekeeping, if you lose the stream at any point, you shouldn't, but if you do, uh, just click refresh on your browser and you'll jump straight back in. Um, however, without further ado, I'd like to uh, pass over to our first presenter, over to you, Simon. Thank you, Andy. Hello, everyone. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen. Hopefully, you can all see that now. All good. Uh, excellent. Well, thank you for joining us today. My name is Simon Meacher. I've worked in the financial industry for the past 18 years uh, for several different uh, companies, ranging from insurance brokers, investment companies, and uh, banks. During this time, I've learned uh, a lot of different prom programming languages, um, and there are a lot of good, exciting technologies out there, but we live in a world where Excel remains constant. I've developed an in-depth knowledge of uh, data warehousing, data integration, reporting, visuals, and analytics, but most recently I've worked on data strategies and data governance programs. I've been a lone wolf developer, but I've also worked is uh, leading large teams across the globe and now at engaging data i lead a team of highly skilled data consultants uh, where we help clients with a whole range of technical and strategic challenges around data personally i'm currently working with an investment company who are developing their data strategy and a new data warehouse in tandem and finally you may have guessed by the picture i'm also a part-time mustache model <laughs> so um, here are a few things that uh, engaging data have as their core principles. Um, firstly, we uh, we approach most of our clients with this, this these principles, and it helps us with our thinking and helps with uh, with solving problems for them. Uh, the first one, right at the very top, is the people. Uh, having the right knowledge, capability, and clear communication with your team is is critical. And so there's a lot of work we do with clients to help that. Uh, processes uh, is uh, really around how we create standards and governance and controls to make those those people and those tools uh, produce value as quickly as possible. In the world of data development, uh, which is a rapidly changing one, and now even more so with the COVID pandemic, um, we need to have processes that enable teams to adapt and uh, still produce high quality output uh, that is critical to building success. And the th final principle is around technology, using the right technology, using it in the right way to do the right job and not picking some, you know, using the old cliche of picking a sledgehammer to crack a walnut. So how does this work inside of automating uh, data warehouse, data-driven reports? So my first example, is uh, is around uh, is around uh, insurance broker. Uh, we were approached to help the trade credit team who had a problem where they had a huge number of um, people consuming data from from the underwriters' websites. Uh, and the UK CEO CEO saw there was issues with this. There's lots of people spending lots of time processing data, all of which was outside of IT. Uh, he was interested, the CEO was interested in the benefits that aggregating the data could give him and the company with a combined UK view. Uh, being able to speak to underwriters and, and the market about the trends going on in the market based on all the client data would benefit the existing clients and help to attract new ones. Additionally, uh, traditionally, sorry, uh, underwriters uh, can only analyze the performance of their own book of business uh, which may also differ from the way that the market is reacting. So insurance 
uh, broker, an insurance broker who can describe what's going on in the market or provide a better view of the marketplace would have uh, the potential, the opportunity to create new insurance products, influence insurance rates or expedite claims, which would provide additional benefit to their clients. For those of you who aren't aware of what trade credit is, it's a new, one of the newest types of insurance. And when I say newest, it's still sort of quite a, you know, 50, 30, 40 years old. Um, but being one of the youngest insurance markets in the uh, or insurances in the in market, you find a lot of companies, underwriters have already developed technology to help them share their own data. So there'll be APIs and there'll be clever ways of sharing data between brokers and underwriters, but also there'd be good web portals that enable data to be, to be shared. And that was the start of the problem. That was how uh, all the insurance brokers were collecting the data from the web portal. So the end goal uh, was a data uh, was the data warehouse had to to be had to have the opportunity to create a highly scalable and reusable data collection uh, process um, within the data warehouse and and help take away some of the uh, some of the strain. This was the reality of what was going on in the in in the office across all of the offices. Uh, each of the this is this is a picture of a Lego convention in the US where people come together to build whatever they want, like from millions of different bricks, all different shapes and sizes. There's no patterns, there's no instructions, it's a free for all. So if you imagine it, you can build it. So this is kind of like the data chaos that we had, the situation with the trade credit insurance broker. It turned out that all the brokers were doing very similar things to the children on in this picture. They were taking the data, they were crunching it, they were building their own reports, uh, using from, from multiple different files. And each client, it took uh, at least a day for each client's report to be created, plus there were always additional reports on top to, to add to the time spent crunching data. So when we started to look at the problem, it actually turned out that in our case, there was at least 90% of the reports that were being built by all the different insurance brokers were, were the same. Uh, regardless of the client, regardless of the office, 90% of the questions we were answering was the same questions. And there were a few fringe things around the outside. But accidents always happen. Uh, the problem being there's always at least one child on that map that will end up Lego up their nose. And it's the same thing that was happening in the offices. There are some reports with that were being built and created at the beginning of month, the month. And then by the end of the month, that same report was being used to answer questions, but the market had changed. So there was no health warnings on the on the data. There was no controls over the, the quality and the, the, the age of the data. So often we were using uh, the data out of out of uh, in the wrong situation. So it was like reading uh, last week's weather report to see what the weather was going to be like this week. However, there are still a few bright sparks on that map in the offices that would be able to create fantastic 80s classic Lego models like the, the Lego spaceship. And we utilize their great ideas along with the expertise of the team to start building some really cool dashboards. So, at first we failed we we tried to build using uh our initial approach was to build using clickview clickview offered us a, a quick straightforward way of being able to plug into the data and pull the data in from their apis however there was still some gaps there's limitations at the time uh, that prevented us from documenting our etl prevented us from documenting our our success and failure uh within the etl process and we were told by our compliance team at the time, this is not suitable. This doesn't create a, uh, a, a, the right rigors around the data. So we want you to try and do something else. Also, the software, uh, Clickview didn't allow us to do any kind of data lineage or any other end user documentation. For those of you that have worked with this kind of tool, you'll appreciate how often, uh, how at times consuming um, all of this and can be very expensive to, to sit down and 
build all your, your, your data models in one tool and then have to do your documentation at the end. Everything gets disconnected. Everything, um, you, can, you can concentrate on the code and forget to do the documentation. You can do the documentation and it doesn't reflect the code. There's all sorts of different scenarios when things aren't linked together. So we ended up uh, breaking down the problem into two. We used Visual Studio to do all the connectivity to the APIs. And that was purely because there was an external company working for, uh, for the insurance broker uh, who did all the app development. And the app development um, and their, their life cycle was all set up. It was very old school, it was very slow. And docu documentation was a, uh, was a, was a luxury. Um, but we were able to get some of the bits done. Then it all started to fall apart. There was still inconsistencies between data and documentation, and um, we weren't getting the right support around the, the, the solution, and it was called a failure. That was it. It was done. So we looked for a different way of doing it, and that's where we converted to use Wearscape because it offered the chance to uh, use all of our existing expertise, our team of developers could continue to do the stuff they were good at and use a tool that helped to automate some of the mundane things like documentation and allowed them to focus on the skills and things they were good at. Not only uh, did we build the data warehouse with all the documentation, but we managed to get all the error handling, which kept the audit and compliance people extremely happy. The impact of doing this, of changing over and creating or using an auto, a tool to automate our, our, some of the processes and some of the requirements we had uh, was quite, uh, quite fantastic, actually. So the UK um, trade credit arm increased its gross written premium in the first year by a million, uh, million pounds. Uh, and that over five years looked around 20% uh, annual growth. So they were extremely happy with the, 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 the way we were able to use the data to help grow their business. The UK arm then started to advertise that they had this lovely analytics suite and other countries across Amir also uh, wanted to use the same thing. And because the technology that we were using from the underwriters was something that was available in other countries across Amir, we created a conveyor belt where we could automatically turn up to the next country, plug into the APIs, pull the data through, and then before you know it, we had an Amir view, not just a UK-wide view of what's going on in the insurance market. And each of those countries experienced a similar, or each of the countries that adopted the analysis saw a similar result, um, similar return on their investment. The bottom line of the of the infrastructure, uh, there was an OPEX improvement, uh, improving uh, the way and streamlining the insurance brokers, uh, where the insurance brokers created and stored the data reduced ongoing maintenance by 33% annually. And the cost savings was just how we, we stopped saving the Excel files all across the network. And that 33% saving of the of not having Excel files everywhere then contributed to the maintenance costs of the data warehouse. The team who the teams who adopted this approach helped to drive significant growth and, and enhance customer satisfaction, which led to increased market share across UK and EMEA, while promoting the leadership who sponsored this project. And as an example of how this worked. You may remember back uh, when uh, Phones for You went into administration, and that impacted, uh, affected um, this insurance broker. And what they were able to do with the analytics suite was very quickly look for Phones for You within the, the dashboards, understand all the connected teams and all of the connected clients to that one risk, and then by nine o'clock, this that all the teams were coming together organizing a uh, an emergency call and created a plan of action by 9 30 their plan of action was how do we get out to our clients how can we help start processing claims and, and assure that our 
clients are well looked after. And by 12 o'clock that, that day, all of the clients had been contacted and each of the teams were assisting each of the clients. So the dashboard acted to join all the brokers together and proactively help clients improving the overall customer service each of the clients received. And that's when we got nominated for award for best use of technology. So it was fantastic accolade for the team to receive that kind of recognition. Unfortunately, we didn't win it, but you can't win them all. Uh, what it did do is, is it proved its worth over the five years. So moving on to automation is king. So uh, it's not always about having a tool that can automate. Sometimes we need to, to look at other, other things that are happening before we can really use automation to its fullest extent. Um, I've uh, recently started looking at uh, a project where I've landed and there's two data warehouses, there's been three data warehouse developers, three project data projects that have helped build these siloed solutions and an inconsistent development practice. There was no coordination between the de developers and everyone was taking their own approach to build a data solution. There was very little documentation because everyone was focused on building the code and documentation can happen afterwards. And also each, each um, developer took their own name and conventions and um, did what they were comfortable with doing. Uh, there was an in, also an inconsistent methodology in the way that um, these, these solutions were gonna be built. It was kind of odd. Some of them were Kimball, some of them were Kimball-esque. All of them were, weren't very good. And that's fine. I mean, it's, they, they were starting to do things, but they just weren't stuck together. And it was quite an expensive um, setup. However, the data inside of all these solutions were really simple. There was an old application using a DB2 database platform, which was simple enough for all of the developers to connect into. But the way in which all of these solutions had done that was very inconsistent. So when one, one data solution was processing data out of it, um, it could take a huge amount of strain, but the way in which all of the solutions were connected to it, it was impossible for the support team to understand who was making the biggest impact and slowing down the front end for the, the business users. But the most important thing was that the board had identified the shift in the marketplace and how competitors were using data for things like AI and you know client portal applications and market analysis that assisted their clients. So the board backed an overall um, uh, the overall data strategy and uh, was was keen to make uh, to bring themselves up to par with their competitors. The challenges uh, around this, uh, we kind of worked in, in reverse. Um, we started with how are we gonna get the data out to people? How are we going to um, take these three solutions and actually conform them into one thing? So the decision was uh, purely cost-based and it were, looked like a Power BI and Excel world where uh, that would be the visualization tool and data discovery tools. But we wanted to build one single source of truth. So consolidate everything together, bring all these solutions into one thing. And uh, the, the way to do that is to get all the developers to do the same thing. So this was the biggest part of the issue. And like Bill Gates highlighted, if you don't get uh, consistency, then all you're doing automation will just highlight how inconsistent you are and make the problem bigger. So we designed and developed an approach um, a development approach for the developers to use that just blended everyone's approach together and met with the culture of the company. We created methodologies so that we could create a consistent output regardless of which developer was building what solution. Um, and we also created standards and processes and governance around what we're doing. So that's kind of things like naming conventions. Let's all use the same naming conventions. Let's make sure we use the same release process and we do the same quality control. Um, all of this though had to fit around the culture of the company, which was quite open-minded and quite progressive, but while it, being a small team, they didn't, they didn't have the luxury of having armies of people to do 
testing and and uh, peer reviews so he just had to do just enough to get it to work but the the uh, the standards the uh, the code that we we were trying to develop um, meant that everyone was doing the thing in everything in the same way so that we had less time we could share the work around each of the developers and we could share the knowledge around and and each of the developers didn't have to spend the time learning how the previous developer had built the solution because they already walked in talking the same technical language and they could quickly identify problems and move on. They could still use their, their expertise in data development. Um, they just spent less time trying to figure out what the last person did. And we then used Wearscape products to automate all of those things together. So there was a lightweight process around the tool that helped us automate all the standards and the processes and the documentation. Uh, we used Wearscape 3D uh, to discover all of the source systems and help automate um, the system itself, the relationships of the data, the cardinality of the data, as well as bringing in business terms so that we ended up creating a, a rich document of uh, the, the source system and where the data lived. We then continue to use Wearscape 3D, which helped to automate the build of the data warehouse to the end product with full documentation that we could import and we could use um, bits and pieces from, from 3D um, and then publish that to the business so they could, they could understand what the solution did. It took us a bit of time to rebuild. Um, a small three-man squad, uh, or two-man squad, um, that was originally working on a, is a contractor basis. Um, we were able to change that into a permanent two-man development squad um, that now run the entire organization's platform. So we've gone from a contract to a perm model, and we've made uh, at least a 70% year-on-year -year cost reduction in doing that, but these two-man squad can cope with everything that's thrown at it. And it's now shifted, the, the company itself is now shifted into a, um, where they can do more with fewer people. There's lots more data requests being processed by these two developers while support, and these developers are also supporting the warehouse. Data is now driving all the decisions for customer services, and uh, creating a strategy for uh, fact-driven, not gut feel. And that's purely because people now trust the data. Because the two-man development guys, you know, they can go in, they can show real value, um, they, can, they can work in an agile way, we're building trust, we're increasing that, that, um, that feel of we can get it right first time. And now business have access to their own data via Excel, so they've got nice shiny new tools. We've increased adoption of those tools by providing training. Uh, the relationships between developers and business are stronger than ever. Uh, it's not an entirely perfect world, but it's, it's far, far stronger than it was 12 months ago. There's a whole host of clear and well understood documentation. There might be the occasional spelling mistake in there, but it's, it's the, the, the fact that they have documentation that's readable by the business users because it's all got, it's got business terms in it, it's fantastic. Um, that, like I mentioned, there's a quick turnaround pace now with these developers. Uh, but now, more importantly, the company has got a scalable way of doing things. With all the standards, with the automation, they can now uh, increase their, their team, they can uh, decrease their team, they can... Um, they can pass work between developers because there's this clear understanding of what's going to happen. Uh, what's going to happen, sorry, what, what the last person's done. Everyone understands the same language. So for me, um, if we all want to build Lego spaceships like this cool one, um, and I certainly, eight-year-old Simon would have loved to have built that, um, I think there's some fundamentals um, that I'd like to offer to you guys. Um, the first one is absolutely understand the value of what you're going to do, what you're going to create, and how will it make it? How will it make a difference? What value are we going to get? 
Um, the three principles are always the way that we approach things. So the first one being in people, engage with the people, whether it's the business, whether it's your developers, you can have the right tool and the right process in place, but if you haven't got people bought in, then the whole thing's not gonna work. The process, keep things as simple as possible and focused on the value. Keep it simple, Simon, the KISS approach. The moment things get complicated, you increase the risk of the project failing full stop. So that more you can do to simplify and take things uh, forward and focus on the end goal, the more success you're likely to have. And technology, pick the right tool for the job. Understand the fundamental issue that you're looking to address. Automation has helped me in my career focus on the on addressing and simplifying the inherent complexity of a difficult task. Can I get can I can I can I get people to focus on the difficult bit and can I automate the rest? Because that I'm gonna get the best out of everyone. So that's me. Thank you very much. Um, uh, these slides will be available to everyone. Um, thank you for listening, I guess. Yeah, thank, thanks very much. Thanks very much, Simon. Um, yeah, the, um, the slides will be available. The presentation is also available. Um, so uh, almost instantly after this, uh, this session finishes, uh, this will all be available on demand. Um, so if there's anything that you want to go back over in, in Simon's session, you can watch it again on repeat and fast forward, etc. Obviously, same with, with Terry's, who we're going to be um, uh, welcoming to speak in a moment. Um, I thought I might just uh, highlight the attachments in the bottom left hand corner. Um, we've put some attachments on there that will, uh, that, that will support the uh, presentation we're about to see. Um, uh, Terry's uh, world record attempt of uh, building a, a cloud data warehouse. Um, and there's also the uh, links to the next webinars uh, in the series, which are which are happening next week. Um, we'll do questions at the end of uh, Terry's uh, uh, segment, if that's okay, and we'll come back to here and do a you know a, a, a fuller questions, and we'll, we'll ask uh, Simon your questions. Um, so without further ado, I think it's it's time to to get our stopwatches out and uh, pass straight over to uh, Terry. Over to you, Terry. Good morning, everyone. And thanks for the introduction, Andy. And uh, good job, Simon, on uh, introducing all the benefits of automation. Now you know what's good about it. I want to show you how to actually do it in a tool called Wearscape. Okay, so I've just switched on to the uh, Wearscape 3D screen. Um, I'm going to take the model-driven approach to data warehouse design. So today I'm going to model a operational data store type data warehouse from a source system. I'm going to model that, profile it, publish it out into a physical model, and then I'm going to commit that physical model to a Snowflake platform. Um, and I'm going to build the Snowflake uh, tables and all of the necessary code to manage the data in those tables. Um, in the 15 minutes, I hope to achieve that um, probably under that time. And I'll take a few questions at the end, but then we have general questions as uh, Andy has just said at the end of the session. So Westgate 3D um, is pretty much stands for data-driven design. In fact, it's actually more model-driven design. Um, but we're gonna work with um, these connections here. These are our source connections, the data we're interested in uh, understanding. And literally, this could be the very, very first time we ever connect this data. All we need is a JDBC or an ODBC connection with read access uh, to do what I'm about to show you. So I'm going to be using a SQL Server source system on-premise, and I'm going to take that data, and I'm going to do the ELT, the extract, the load, and the transform to move that data onto the Snowflake cloud and have an operational uh, data store uh, in the cloud that we can then use uh, for our uh, end users or for our star schemas or for any other purpose. So this trade source system is where I'm going to start. Um, and with this layout, you find this workflow here um, is reactive to whatever you're con uh, connected to. So the workflow is the suggestion of what could happen next. And it tends to be in the right order as well. So these buttons will fill up in do this, do this, do this. So it tends to suggest the kinds of workflows that we consider to be best practice. You don't have to follow those. 
you don't have to build ODSs. We also build data vaults. We also build star schemas. We also build per normal form and any hybrid approach on any of those. So I'm starting here with Trader Source System. I'll discover the connection. I'm going to ask it to document this into my Traders project here. And today I'm going to use the date as my versioning number. So, uh, sorry, wrong one, two, three. So I'm versioning this on uh, the 23rd of the 7th, 2020. And I'm going to ask it to look for the DBO schema on that source. Remember, this could be any ODBC or JDB source. It could also be uh, flat files like uh, delimited files, fixed width files, XML files, and to an extent, some of the JSON files. Uh, we will be covering Avro and Parquet in the near future. My filter options here are to say I want to use all the tables, no views at this point. Um, what to include, percent being everything, and what to exclude from my search. And in this particular case, I want to eliminate any of the sys tables from my uh, view. Uh, and then that will give me the full discovery that I want. I then say OK to this, and I can now set the discovery running. I'm going to do a full discovery, which is everything. Indexes, constraints, the lot. Quick is a conceptual model, and custom gives you a whole uh, dialogue of tick boxes that you tick and untick what you want to discover and what you don't want to discover. So very quickly there, you see a model has appeared in the background and in my overview window here. The second phase of discovery, which you can skip, is to profile the data. I'm going to profile that data now quickly. And this runs a bunch of SQL queries against the actual source data to provide some data quality metrics about that data. So I'm going to hit the profile. And you'll see here, these are the things it's running against each of the columns as it goes through. And depending on the data type of the column, some metrics will, will apply and some metrics won't. So it, it won't apply uh, all the metrics to all of the columns. Right, so we now have a model. I can use this overview area to see my whole model. Um, we can break the model up into groups if you wanted to, so you can have it in smaller parts uh, because very, very big models obviously will just fill the screen and it will look something like a, a black dot like that in the corner of your screen. Uh, this particular model, the source model, provides me with SQL Server data types because it's a SQL Server source and it's also picked up the names of the attributes and the entities as per the source system. Um, we don't suggest you correct the namings at this stage, um, although you can. Uh, it's more something you do in the uh, transformation layer rather than the load layer, but you can transform on load if you wanted to. Now, this is a very good source system because it's provided me with um, relationships. And if I don't like the relationship, for example, this one here, I could flip it around. That doesn't change the source at all. It just changed my documentation to represent how it looks. Uh, and also, I can see here that an order ID for order details, an order ID for the order header. It didn't find a relationship there, so the foreign key constraint was not declared. Now, if there's many situations like this, I could use my foreign key declaration wizard and declare the foreign keys, but I'm not going to. I'm just going to draw in the relationship where it matters. Now, the reason why this source model is important is because this is the blueprint for, sorry, let me just do that again. Uh, order ID onto order ID. Okay, um, this is the blueprint for the automation. If it knows what what the relationships in the source system are, it can work out the joins when we load this data into the data warehouse later on. Okay, um, so that's my model. I'm going to go with that. Um, if there's any tweaks, we suggest you copy this model into a logical area and then manage the logical model. I'm not going to do that today in the short time. I'm going to build it in 15 minutes. So I'm going to go straight to my ODS. Now, at this point, we're going to use a feature of Wayscape 3D called model conversion rules. And these model conversion rules allow me to convert this model to a model of my choosing. It looks for entities. It looks for data types. It looks for attributes. And based on the entities, attributes, and data types and other things it finds, it will transform the model to, in this case, I'm going to do a type 2 ODS model. So down here, you'll see I've got this ODS traders model. At the moment, I've just got the example model in there. I'm now going to take this one. And using some transformation rules, I'm going to advance copy this to my ODS traders model. And again, I'm going to use the same 
naming standard for my version. And I'm going to apply some model conversions. Now, these are our transformation rules. They transform the model from one type to another case. In this case, I'm going to do a source to red data store. And I'm also going to make some commitment towards Snowflake at this point, i.e. translate the data types uh, and any column names that are non-compliant to be Snowflake compliant. So it's now transforming that source model into a ODS history model, but mapped onto the source. So the, uh, the ELT mapping is maintained at this point between the new model and the source model. Okay, so now we see a different model appearing, um, the ODS traders model, 2020723. And we can see here, the naming standards I've applied in the rules is DS hiss as the prefix. Um, we can also see that the start date, end date, current flag version and update time have been added as the control columns on a type two table. Um, and we can see that these DS hiss tables, which are the, per the persistent tables, are getting the data from the stage tables. And then down the bottom here, in the green and purple area, we'll see the purple stage tables, which are getting the data from the load tables. And then we have the load tables, which are getting the data from the source, which I just discovered five minutes ago. Um, and to see that more graphically, you can use our table, trace table source, and you can see the lineage of that um, entity. In this case, I'm sourcing from one source, but if there are multiple sources, you'll see them all branching into this uh, flow here. So there's the stage table, there's the load table, and there's the original source table on the database that we got it from five minutes ago. So this model is now physicalized to an extent towards the, the Snowflake platform. Um, I could still change my mind at this point if I wanted to and commit it to Azure or Teradata or any other platform I choose. <coughs> um, I'm going to continue with the process towards Snowflake. So this Wayscape 3D, it manages this metadata on a Postgres SQL database. I'm now going to export this uh, into a red export model. So this is pretty much like the architect preparing the plans to deliver to the builder. So it's like putting the uh, plans into their final representation. At this point, I'm going to be committing them to a snowflake. So I'll take these, this plan, and I'm going to prepare for Wayscape Red. Wayscape Red is the builder tool. It's in charge of all the generation of all the DDL code, the DML code, and the data transformation code, and the data workflows. Um, so Red's the builder, and 3D is the architect. So I'm pretty much preparing the final plans for submission to the builder. So I'll prepare for Red. Um, I'm going to put it into the Red export category here, and I'm going to stick with my naming standard for the version. And at this point, I'm going to use the target I've chosen, which is Snowflake. But even now, I could decide to U-turn on that and commit to a different platform. Uh, but I'm going to commit to the Snowflake platform as per the uh, rules specification. And there's a few things you can uh, tweak on the uh, de deployment, uh, on the uh, preparation. And I want to just prepare that. Now, at this point, it's asking me which objects want to go onto which logical schemas. So I've got these three logical schemas here, load, stage, and EDW. So load is taking all the load tables, stage is taking all the stage tables, and EDW is taking the DSS tables. Um, these were set in those rules I just ran, and these are logical representations. When I deploy this to the physical environment, I will need to map these logical onto a physical. If it finds a map by name, it won't ask me. If it doesn't find a match by name, it'll ask me to uh, resolve it. Or if it's an ambiguous match, it'll ask me to resolve it when it deploys. I want to create a new group here today. I'm just going to call it demo release. Again, this is a release numbering that you can name uh, according to your own naming standards, the release naming standards. And I want to include everything I want to deploy in that release. And now, the final thing here is just to check this. I'm going to go from SQL Server. Uh, to Snowflake. So there's the final check on the data types being done. And it's now ready to be exported. Now, appearance-wise, this model won't have changed much. Um, there'll be a few minor tweaks behind the scenes in terms of really getting it ready for Snowflake, but it, it looks pretty much the same as the model I just showed you before. But this is now prepared, ready for a Snowflake deployment. Now, today, I'm going to deploy into my Snowflake environment. Here's my Snowflake dashboard. 
Um, this is the demo Terry Mooney I'm using today as the database. And these are the schemas. And these first three schemas you see here, which are sorted in uh, alphabetical order, dev EDW, dev load, and dev stage. So that load logical schema is matching onto dev load. The stage logical schema is matching onto dev stage. And the uh, EDW logical schema is matching onto DBW. In here, I've only got a few things. We provide a date dimension out the box that's sitting there. And this is just a little sample I loaded earlier uh, to test the load was working. So we're going to populate some more stuff into the schema now. Uh, from Wescape Red's point of view, so this is the other tool now I'm firing up. And I want to log on to the Snowflake demo dev. Now, this is the metadata repository for my development on Snowflake. I could have a dev repository, test repositories, pre-prod repositories, prod repositories, any number of different dev repositories. But I'm going to use this Snowflake demo dev today. And this is housed or hosted on a local SQL Express, um, but it also can be hosted on an Azure platform or a remote data services platform. And we can now see here that at the moment, I've got just a couple of stage tables. Uh, let's go with the demo one here. I've got uh, just the stage table and the dimension in here. There's no load tables uh, and there's no data store tables in here yet. Okay, so let's just minimize that for a moment and go back to my 3D. So now I'm ready to commit this model across. Now I'm just gonna use this, this one here, which is the same one. In fact, now I'll take this one and map it across. Let's do that. So we'll export this one across to Wearscape Red. So this is pretty much putting the plans in the post. In our case, the post is an XML file that represents all the metadata of this model. And that's now being deployed across into the XML file. And once it's been put in the post, which it has been now, I can now use our setup administrator tool to pick that post up and deploy it into my target. So I'm going to my application folder here. I'm changing to my temp folder where I've just deployed that package to. And there's my package sitting there, the traders export um, with today's date 2307-2020 on it. Okay, so I'm gonna export uh, commit that now to my physical Snowflake red build. So I'm going to install it into that same repository I was just showing you, Snowflake demo dev, and OK that. And this is the first deployment of this package, so everything is new. Um, if it wasn't the first deployment, if I was putting a patch release out or change release, then there'd be different a different summary here. There'd be changes or updates or drop and recreate. We tend to drop and recreate load and stage tables, but we just tend to alter persistent tables so we don't destroy any data. Um, so I'm happy with that um, output. I'm going to go here and I'm going to do a load with the row counts. Uh, here's a situation where one of those logical schemas load is ambiguous. I've got two loads in my target. So it's asking me which of these loads do I want to put it on. It's that load is the physical one I want to commit it to. And then off it goes. Now it's deploying the metadata from that XML package into the uh, Wearscape Red metadata repository. And once it's deployed the metadata, it starts acting upon that metadata to commit the DDL. So it's now creating the, the, the uh, objects on my Snowflake. So if I was to come over to Snowflake here now and uh, refresh here, uh, we start to see the load tables appearing on dev load here. And shortly the uh, stage tables will start to appear on dev stage. If I keep refreshing the screen, we can see the progress here as now putting the stage tables out there. And if I go back here, we can see it's now finished the stage tables. It's now committing the DS tables to the Snowflake targets. Once it's done the actual DDL and executed that DDL, it will then start to write the DML. So it's starting to write the DML scripts after this. And those are the scripts in this case, because my target is PowerShell, I'm generating, uh, sorry, my, my target is Snowflake, I'm generating PowerShell scripts, and those PowerShell scripts execute SnowSQL or SnowPipe commands. Obviously, if I was going to a different platform, such as Azure, then we'd be doing PowerShell for Azure uh, and using Transat SQL. And if I was going to something like uh, Amazon Redshift, I'd be using Redshift code uh, in uh, either .bat or uh, PowerShell scripts as well. 
So it's now scripting the um, load uh, scripts and now scripting the stage scripts. And finally, it will st uh, script the uh, uh, DSS history. So here now, if I refresh, I pretty much can see everything is now populated into these Snowflake, Dev EDW, Dev Load, and Dev Stage uh, schemas. So all this stuff is pretty much new, uh, just committed uh, now. Okay, so back here in Wayscape Blue, let's just have a look and see if it's finished. Just doing the DS code now. And here in Wayscape Red, if I refresh, we see that demo release appearing now, that um, group that I actually created when I exported from 3D. And in here, we're seeing the load tables, the stage tables, and the data store tables. They're different colors because they're on different schemas. Uh, and we've set those as different targets. They don't have to be different schemes in the same database. They could be different databases if necessary. Um, uh, let's just check the progress. There we are, application import complete. So that's now a clean bill of health in terms of that. Um, and this can be kept as part of your release documentation. You send it to a file and you can keep it with your um, release notes. Um, so that's all good. So let's go back here. So we now have a load to extract the data from the source, the stage to convert the data ready to uh, deployment into my history tables and then my history tables. At the moment, these are just empty tables because nothing's actually executed in terms of code. We've just generated the code. So if I was go to load customers here, for example, and look at the properties, we'll see here, this is the PowerShell script that you and me would have to have written in order to do this. Uh, now it's been automated, okay? So very quickly, I'm gonna put all of this into a scheduler job. I'm gonna put this as a refresh traders ODS. I wanna give it up to six levels of, uh, this could go up to hundreds if you wanted to, depending on how powerful or parallel your server configuration is. Um, I'm gonna stick the six on our small build and I'm gonna just go um, with all the uh, stuff in there as we've got it and okay that. Right, so we now see a new job here, which is now on our scheduler. And if I right click on this job and uh, view the actual dependency diagram, we can see there's the lovely flow that's gonna occur when I run this job. All the loads done in parallel, followed by the stages when the dependent load is finished. And then the, all the DS hisses will load when all the dependent stages are finished. So arrowheads wait for the arrow tails to finish. Um, so I'm happy with that. So let's just go back to the scheduler here and kick this job off and we'll start the job running. And as it starts to run, we'll see it waits for a scheduler to pick it up. And then when a scheduler on its polling action picks it up, it'll then switch to a running state. There we go, and now it's running. While it's doing that, I'm gonna just go back to the builder here and generate some documentation for this whole thing. So I'm gonna document it into a self-contained HTML set. And this can be viewed by anybody with a browser in the world. You don't have to have any Wayscape software to view it. Uh, and you don't have to have any license to view it. It's uh, just an extension to the uh, documentation. Uh, try Traders ODS I'm doing today. And then, okay. So this, here we are in a matter of seconds, the full documentation. And as Simon said, it's all standardized. It's all um, uh, in sync with the actual metadata. It's in sync with the actual code. And you can generate this documentation as frequently as often as you like. Uh, It'll always be uh, up to date with the actual um, metadata. Okay, so once it's generated, you can then view it with any browser. Uh, all of this can be managed with a style sheet, so you can, you can brand this your own way, and you can also use your own fonts and colors for headers and text. The simple one is the user documentation. This is the non-techie stuff. So the thing we have in here is a glossary or a data dictionary explaining the fields where we've actually put the commentary in. Um, and uh, that's all good. On the actual um, demo release here, we don't show much in the doc user documentation, but if I go to technical documentation here and show you the demo release, we can now see the load table and the load table, how it's actually sourced, where it's sourced from, and what extended properties we're using to drive it on Snowflake, and also which tables it feeds to, so which it impacts downstream. If I go to the next table in line here, stage customers, 
I can see the same thing happening here. Stage customers come from load customers, which came from SQL traders, which was the source we discovered in 3D 20 minutes ago. And then we finished 15, 20 minutes ago. And then data store here, the DS customer, we can see this is the actual script that's currently running. That's the current version of it. All of this code is version control and audit trail. And we have here the columns and where it came from and any and the transformations it went through, the data lineage it was applied to get it to that stage um, and anything that feeds off it downstream. So at the moment, I've not built any downstream, but the next logical thing would be to put a start schema to the right-hand side of this. Uh, having done the EDW, you can then do the start schema following on. Okay, so let's just go back to our uh, scheduler here and have a look at our job and view the audit trail. And we now have um, a complete set of, you know, in, in, in Snowflake terms, we use the put copy to move that data from the on-premise SQL server to the uh, Snowflake cloud. So you can see these put copy commands being repeated for each of the table, the load tables that have been moved across all the way down to the very end here, where you'll start to see when we do the DS tables, eight rows there, three, two, four, one rows there, eight rows there, eight, two, seven, one rows there. So back to the builder here, if I was to go to my DS customers table here and display the data, there's the data now fully uh, into our data warehouse on the ODS. Um, and that was populated in the stage tables, that stage table was populated in the load table, and that load table was populated from the source system that I discovered back here in 3D, uh, this source system here that I mapped it through. There's my 20 minutes, data warehouse in 20 minutes um, from a source system uh, built built from a SQL Server source system onto a Snowflake cloud. Thank you very much, Terry. Um, you know, that was great. Um, if we could um, if we could go back to the three of us now um, with the stop sharing, that'd be that'd be fab. And um, I'll put some um, I'll put some uh, questions uh, to you both, if that's OK. So um, first one. Um, I think going back to the sort of premise of it, um, I'll put it to both of you, whichever one uh, wants to uh, you know, chip in first kind of thing. So how does data warehouse automation uh, differ from ETL and EL, more conventional ETL and sort of ELT uh, tools, if you like? I can take that one. Yep. yep. Um, we add more than just the data movement. I know today's demonstration was showing data movement. But at every step of that stage, you can add your own interpretations around the data. So we're more intelligent in things like adding the start, end date, current flag, and all of those extra columns that are required by the model. If you're building data vault, you need things like record sources and load dates. Um, so a lot of the control column, what we call the donkey work that would be required, is actually automated into the product as part of the tool. Yep. So that's over and above ETL. Um, and also, it provides much more complex in some ways transformations because you're building your transformations on the target platform. We're not taking the data away from the platform, manipulating it, putting it back on the platform. We're keeping the data on the platform, transform it in situ, and therefore the, the, the operational speed and efficiency is that much better. Okay, good. Um, and I'm, I'm going to go back to the sort of first, first presentation now, so Simon. Um, we had that moment where, you know, the Lego was all over the floor. I really like that analogy, actually. It's reminded me a little bit of my house. Um, <laughs> but um, uh, in terms of, um, obviously, you know, the, the company would have had a, a, an idea of where it wanted to get to with data. But in terms of sort of barriers um, uh, that you had to kind of overcome and stuff, what was, what was the, was there any objections and, uh, you know, or any any sort of roadblocks in the way, and and kind of how did you get around them to to, to get to where you got to in the end? Um, I guess the, the 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 most complicated bit was um, was speaking to um, the the people providing the data into us to to help us work with us to get for us to be able to connect up and, and get the data in. Um, there's a lot of contract negotiations that go on. Um, because sometimes the data wasn't free um, so that kind of held up a few um, a, a few of the a few of the pipelines a few of the things to be plugged in but generally no because um, once people understood that we were going to make life easier 
um, certainly from the, all the brokers, they're like, yeah, get, I don't want to be doing this. I want to be talking about insurance. I don't want to be, say, here crunching numbers or using Excel. Once we automated all that and, and, and put it in place, they, they, they save time. They can spend their time doing the things that they're good at. Yeah, yeah, cool, awesome. And um, in terms of in terms of the teams, in terms of the people, I mean, we, we, we talked about the technology and the processes and stuff. In, in, in terms of the teams, would you think that, your conventional data team. So if, if if someone watching today is, you know, at the beginning of this kind of journey, um, uh, is there anything that they need to be thinking about in terms of people perhaps or or anything else? And, you know, is there a, is there a good kind of person to have on your team to, to, to be on this journey? I mean, is there any special skills or something that they might need to consider? Um, it depends on the, on the company itself. If you're a small company and, you, you know, you, you're not going to have an army of people to be able to help, then you're going to need some sort of sort of analyst developer, someone who's happy to go and speak, talk to people, understand as much as they can do, and put it into practice and build data models and enjoy all of those aspects of interaction and, and problem solving. But then in big companies, you then start to kind of get your problem solvers who, you know, lock, like me sometimes, I, I want to lock myself away from the kids, sit in a dark room and fix the problem uh, without any distractions. And sometimes, if you can build that kind of team that suit and that suits your team uh, that person that in that will suit your team then that's that's the right choice for you but you know it depends on the size uh and the you know the, the amount of money you've got to spend um it's on what you look for yeah can i just add to that i think also what you find with automation tools is we're not out to replace people we're just there to make people more productive what they do so existing SQL skill sets, existing data warehousing skill sets, existing understanding of Kimball, Dan Linstead, and those sort of processes, we're not replacing that. We're just making people with those skills already far more productive with those skills. So rather than spend weeks building things, they can build things in days. Uh, and therefore, you're, you you get far more success quicker uh, with the same people. Yeah. Yeah. And um, we, we, we had a question in just a moment uh, ago, which... Um, which is which is interesting, actually. I, I, you seem to allude to the fact that um, people were quite um, keen to to move to a new uh, a, a new way of working once they should see it was 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 easier. But was mm. that initial consultation with them? You know, people are quite resistant to change after all, especially in traditional industries. I imagine, like insurance, was that an initial uh, consultation with them? Uh, difficult at all or, or you know did they want to listen to the people te technology kind of thing yeah the hardest thing is to um is is to really go in and try and help, help get to understand the problem and understand what they're doing and why they're doing it people mm. are quite guarded they want to hold that close to their chest so you know um if you know your approach how you do that I mean, traditionally, people turn up with large documents, trying to fill every minutia of detail out to sort of put it into like a, I don't know, a waterfall style project. And that doesn't always work. And, you know, at the time, that was an IT approach. They were always very waterfall and very, very slow to deliver. Whereas we went in and we were more open arms, trying to help and trying to be very honest and transparent about what we were there to do. Um, and that helped. That certainly helped. But there was always that resistance. But... I think it ebbed away over time once the, the value and, you know, when you deliver to one person and they've got a good news story, they tell quite a few people. I mean, it doesn't travel as fast as bad news, but, you know, it takes a lot longer. Um, but that eventually sort of spread its way out. And when every, everyone adopts based on their peers, so if someone else is adopted to a new way of working, then they're kind of more open to it. So uh, we weren't going to sled, you know, go in as a sledgehammer and say we must do this. We were a little bit more gentler and it, and it worked. Perfect, perfect. Well, I'm, I'm very aware of the time and um, we've, we've got lots more questions that we, we could have gone on for a, a, a little while longer, but um, we'll make sure that those questions get answered uh, after, the, after the webinar is finished. Um, however, I'd like to say a massive thank you to our two presenters today. Uh, great job for both of them. I've really enjoyed myself today. So um, it's goodbye, uh, goodbye from our presenters and um, We'll uh, we'll catch you at the next one. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Cheers. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.